I was kind of a rebel, and uh, the only time I wrote home, once in a while we were given orders that you had to write a letter home, and that was me. <laughs> My name is Gerard Bessignell. I was born in Windsor, Ontario. When I turned around 19 years old, I joined the service. The only reason I joined, some friends of mine were gone for a few days, and when they came back, I asked them, where were you? They said, oh, we joined the Army. I, baloney, you know. Yeah, come on back with us. I said, oh, yeah, sure, I'll, I will. I had a good job. I had a good union job and in a union shop. I was making, at that time, what they call pretty good money, you know. When they were had to go back to London, uh, they said, well, you coming with us? I said, oh, yeah, you know, I'll go get a ticket. I wasn't going to back out then, so I went and bought a ticket, got on a train with them, didn't tell anybody. A few days later, I came home, and my mother says, where have you been? The shop's been calling for you. You're going to lose your job. I says, I got a job for three years now. She said, what are you talking about? And she says, you're lying to me. Don't you tell me that, you know, you joined the army. I said, yeah. And she sat down and she broke down and started crying. My other three brothers were in the service. Two were in World War II and my other brother was in the Navy at the time. And uh, anyway, uh, so I was in the army. I ended up being led into the Royal Canadian Artillery. We were in Camp Petawawa here, and that's one of our 25-pounders, and we were practicing a drill because we were going to Parliament Hill to fire a 21-gun salute. I forget if it was the Queen's birthday or the King's birthday. <laughs> that's me on the tail end. We were supposed to uh, relieve the 27th Infantry Brigade in Germany, but they kept us and were training us to relieve the 25th infantry brigade in Korea and we didn't know that until the very last minute. In Korea, United Nations troops push on in the cautious advance against the communists. An advance whose purpose is not to seize ground but to wipe out the enemy. We arrived in Korea around the middle of April in 1953 we went on trucks and uh, we relieved the others that were serving there already. I was sent up uh, with the Royal Canadian Regiment as an observer for the artillery. And we had a crew of uh, six people from the artillery, my officer, myself, and four signal men, etc. When When we first Landed in Pusan, they put us on a narrow gauge railway track. There was hundreds of little kids. They had sores on them. They were dirty. Some had shorts on, nothing on the top. Some had a, maybe a t-shirt on or something. And they had their hands out. They wanted cigarettes. They wanted anything they could get. And there, there was no, no one like uh, parents with them. And it was sad because I think all the younger population, probably from 16 to 30 or 40, were drafted into the service. This picture here, this is Bill Steptoe. He was from Windsor. Bob Walsh from Windsor. And that's the cute guy back here is me. The enemy knew we were green. They launched a very vicious attack on us. 
It, it was the worst attack uh, in the Canadian history in the three years that were there. We suffered a lot of casualties that night. And um, the troops we were fighting against were very, very seasoned troops. They were the Chinese, they weren't North Koreans. The Korean forces, they were just about finished. That's why the Chinese helped North Korea. They sent 350,000 Chinese in. We were on Hill 187. We were with the 3rd Regiment RCRs, Charlie Company. I'll never forget it, that's for sure. And uh, the infantry part was very undermanned. We had some uh, what they call CATCOMs, Korean Augmentation Troops, and uh, to fill in some of the spaces that were empty from wounded people. They were South Korean soldiers, and there was no communication with us, and you, you didn't even know if who they were, you know. Altogether, total, we had 90 casualties. We had, uh, I think it was 30, 34 of Canadians were killed that night. And there was four CATCOMs that were killed. I don't know how long it went on. Uh, you, you just lose track of all the time. And uh, there was three guys back in our bunker. They were down there and they wanted to go out and repair the telephone lines because of, they were cut from shrapnel. And I told them to stay there where it was safe because until everything lifted. So when everything lifted, I, I went down there to see what was going on and it was pretty silent then. I, I remember going going to our bunker. I tripped over a body. You, you know, it was, I, I don't know if it was an enemy or one of the catcoms. I couldn't tell because you couldn't understand. I, I checked him, he was alive. His eyes were wide open and very scared. When I went in our bunker, uh, as soon as I got there, I noticed uh, an artillery shell landed right in the doorway of our bunker, and two of my guys were sitting on my cot right across from the doorway of the bunker. And as soon as I saw them, I, I don't want to be graphic about it, but I knew they were both killed instantly. And the third guy that was in there was on his cot near the doorway of the bunker and the only he was unconscious from the concussion i came out and i, I was over by this guy that was laying in the trench again and uh, i don't know what happened i start crying like a baby i was i was crying like a baby and i uh and Jim was still in the bunker. He was unconscious. And an officer went by and he said, what are you crying for? I, I said, my two buddies are dead in there. He said, this is no place for crybabies. He says, get out of it. And uh, it snapped me right out of it. And I start doing what I had to do again. The enemy barrage stopped. But meanwhile, we did we did get some communication uh, with one of the other uh, outposts and we called our own artillery down upon us to get the enemy off. They were in the trenches. We threw hand grenades that they, they were duds. None of them were, none of them were fused. We weren't allowed to fuse them without permission. And, that was sad. You might as well have thrown rocks at the enemy. And some of the some of the fellas, after they couldn't fire anymore, their guns were empty. They were swinging at the enemy, swinging their rifles like baseball bats. But uh, when our own artillery came down upon us, our battery fired over 4,000 rounds of 25 pounders, 
and that uh, that chased the enemy off our hill, our own artillery. That's the bunker inside here where uh, two of my guys and my crew were killed, and the third guy survived. And uh, we're just, this is a couple weeks later after the battle we were in. We had to come back on this hill before we were relieved the ceasefire day, the 27th of July. We use that as our Remembrance Day for the Korea veterans. The day I have a picture when we're ripping everything apart, because we had to, they wanted us to tear whatever we had built there to tear it apart so that it was no man's land, but if the enemy came, they couldn't use that stuff against us. We fired red, white, and blue smoke over on the enemy lines to uh, let them know we were still there. <laughs> Anyway, uh, this young guy, I call him a young guy, he's probably my age at that time, but he looked like he was about 15. And he was walking not too far past me. There was a pathway and then going down the hill to where the kitchen was. And a shell came in and landed not too far away. And a piece of shrapnel caught him under the jaw and came out the back of his head and he never knew it hit him. And that, that's the last person I saw that was killed. All those pictures, they're indelible in my mind. Soon as I, I think about it, I see it. I still, I picture my two friends and uh, it wasn't pretty. Politics wanted the Canadians to believe that that war was over because they were talking peace talks, if you want to call them peace talks, for almost two years, from 19, I think 1951 to 1953. I joined on June the 6th, 1951. I got home right near the end of May. Yeah, I, I made it home just a couple of days before my brother's wedding. And uh, there's nothing, nobody come up and said, hey, how you do, you know, like, I don't know. Everybody was kind of closed mouth, didn't say much of anything. One time I was duck hunting and uh, we were in Willowwood Beach down on Lake Erie and we were duck hunting. It was a beautiful day and no ducks are flying. And this fella had a 12 gauge shotgun and he, he said, is this how they did it in Korea? He cranked his shotgun and fired around near my feet and some sand hit me like in the face and stuff. And, and I had a semi-automatic shotgun and, and I took the safety off and I had it pointed right at his stomach. I just whistled around and I, to this day, to this day, I don't know why I didn't pull the trigger. I, you know, it was kind of an, and, and that was in 1954. <laughs> you know, I, I haven't been home too long. It was in the fall, and I got home in May. I was at the Cenotaph a few years ago in Windsor, and there was a member of parliament was there. He mentioned World War I, World War II, nothing about the Korean War. And after it was finished, I knew the fella. And I asked him, I says, how come you didn't say anything about the Korea War? He said, that wasn't a war. He says it was a police action. And then later on, people got tired of hearing it was a police action, so they called it uh, a, a Korean conflict. And it wasn't until not long ago that it was declared that it was actually a war.
this guy I knew uh, on the golf course, he found out that I was a veteran. He says, I didn't know you were a veteran. He says, you're a hero. I said, his name was Bob. I said, Bob, don't say that. I, I said, I'm not a hero, I'm a survivor. I said, all the heroes are still over there. They're buried. We didn't bring anybody home. I said, they're still over there. They're the heroes. They gave their life for, for the freedom of the South Korea, you know. When I was in Seoul, people were living in cardboard shacks and the tallest building was about three stories high. I went back about eight years ago and, you know, after I saw how the people were living, and they were number six in the economic world at that time, and uh, I was amazed, just amazed. I couldn't get over it. Cars, people driving cars, and high-rise buildings, and all you saw was uh, construction cranes building. The older people, when they had signs on the bus, Korea veterans, Canadian Korea veterans and that, and you could see some of them at the side of the road when they saw the sign. They showed their respect, you know. When I was talking to my two friends at the cemetery, I said, you gave your life for these people. And to me, it was worth, worth it, you know and um, except for the fact that uh, not, one, not one death was worth it, you know, of our people especially. But, uh, but that's what freedom's all about.